Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 6570 Family Project Podcast. In this podcast, we are normally putting aside the power struggles and finding paths forward, especially for our young women today in the second half of childhood as parents so that we can help them walk toward that confidence, respect, and wisdom, mental wellness that they need in order to prepare them for the world. But today, in the wake of everything that's been happening here in the U.S. and what has shaken the U.S. and around the world, today I want to talk all about what we can do with our kids. How can we help have another conversation with our kids? How can we face them again and say this has happened again, but still help them know that uh, they are safe, right, in a world that is obviously not, and that unexpected can come. And this is a really tough time. I'm going to take my time in uh, doing this podcast today. I myself have had a huge emotional week, which then I have guilt over saying you have, you know, no right to have emotions when, you know, people are really, really um, hurt out there. I might cry. I've been crying all week. Um, but that's okay. We, this is a hard time. It's a hard subject. And I think the more real that we can be with each other, the more real we can be with our families and our kids about it, uh, the better we can become. Right. So we, it, you can't make sense out of this. There is no sense in a senseless act like this, right? What we have to focus on when anything senseless happens in our lives, um, whether you are a direct hit or, you know, you are just a auxiliary hit on the side, right? You have to focus on what you can do to positively affect you and those around you in the situation. And in order to move forward, do the next right thing, right? Um, to, to steal a line out of um, Frozen 2 right there, Anna has that song. And that song is really powerful, actually. Um, I refer to it a, a lot, just do the next right thing, take, take the next step and do the next right thing through the hard, right? Um, anyway, so there are so many victims here, right? The more stories that have been coming out and unfolding, the more lives that we see have been changed. Some lives are forever gone and that is tragic. Some are shattered. Some have incredibly steep mountains that have now been put in the way of their life that they are going to have to do the hard, hard work of getting past. Some are changed with guilt that is so powerful that I worry about them. Some are so changed with anger that it will take a long road of healing. Some with frustrations, desperation, sadness, disbelief, you name it. We have all felt the reverberating effects of what happened here, just like we have all the times before. So the first school, I mean, there's been mass shootings in so many different places, right? But the first school mass shooting that I could really find on record was in 1998. And then of course, Columbine, uh, was a year later. And the first one, um, uh, Thurston high school, I believe it, something like that. But, uh, the point is it was a child, right? In most of these cases, this is a child or someone that is just coming out of childhood and they still are mentally a child. I talk a lot about just because they turn 18 does not mean they're an adult, right? Just because they turn 18 and have the adult title does not make them an adult person right? And so these are children that are obviously missing so much that are turning around and hurting other children. And it's not always the case, but most of the time it is kids hurting kids, right? That first one was a 15 year old that killed his parents and then went to school and killed uh, some students at school, right? Columbine happened. You guys, there's been three 150, you know, now that I'm saying this out loud, um, I I do want to say, this is what we're going to be talking about today. So if you do have, and I apologize for not saying it sooner, but if you do have 
kids in the car and this is a conversation you want to have just with them later on, feel free to pause this and come back to it when it's just your years or listen to it as a family. That is up to you and how you communicate with your family. But we are going to be talking about these hard subjects today. So there's been 300, over 350 school shootings since 1998. That is more than one a month. This is 2022. On average, we have had, when you space it out, more than one a month of school shootings. So when these things keep coming up over and over and over, how do we still help our kids know that it's okay and that we're going to go on and that tomorrow isn't going to be a tragedy for us? we pray, right? So again, we have to talk about the things that we can do something about. So we're going to go through four conversations today. And these four conversations are conversations that need to be happening and they cannot, can not be finger pointed and go around in a circle. I mean, you, you think I have four kids, right? So I think of my four kids sitting down in a circle or I guess it would be more of a square if they're sitting down. Right. But anyway, and one is just finger pointing at the other and finger pointing at the other. And it just goes around what happens. You guys, it just revolves. It keeps going around. Whatever's happening keeps happening. And everyone is just blaming everyone else. No one is standing in their accountability and saying, okay, this is what we can do. This is what I can do in my area. This is what you could do in your area, right? This is what I could do in my area, all of that, but standing still in your accountability. I think, I hope, I pray that everyone in this nation, everyone in this world can agree that this, what happened last week in Uvalde, Texas, where an 18 year old walks into a school and has a gun and kills 19 kids and two teachers. And then the subsequent passing of one of those teachers' husbands, right? I hope and pray. And I think that no one in the world thinks that is okay. No one in the world would agree and shrug their shoulders and say, yep, that's life, right? I think we can all get on the same page about that. I think we can all get on the same page that what happened is not okay. And there were things that led up to that, which means in these four conversations we're going to talk about today, everyone can take accountability in them. Okay. Think about like a Venn diagram style, right? Uh, With these four circles, and there's going to be this middle area where they all overlap. And that's where we need to be. But in order to get there, everyone needs to stand in accountability. Okay. Now this is not going to be a political. I am not playing sides of the aisle, so to speak, or what have you. That is not who I am. And everyone has a right to their own opinions, but these four conversations have to be being had and accountability has to be in them. Okay, guys. So let's start with the first one, which is mental health. Okay. I've heard this week, this one being finger pointed to a lot. Well, he was disturbed. Well, he had that, right? Okay. So he had mental health issues and obviously, obviously, right? So what can we do here? And I'm talking about what can you do in your living room? What can you do in your dining room right now? That's what today is about. How are we going to move forward with our kids, even though this is happening? So it's having conversations. Okay. It sounds so, so simple, but it's something that is not done nearly enough having conversations. The worst thing that can happen is that we as a nation and as a world, especially as a nation, because let's face it, there isn't other nations that really go through this, like the United States does, which begs its own question. But the worst thing we can do as a nation is become numb to this. We can just accept it as a norm. I've talked before and I will talk again and I will say it until my grave. I am unsubscribing to normal. There is too many norms today or normals that are just being accepted that are hurting us, that are hurting the the people, the kids, the families that these norms are, right? So do not 
become numb to this. Every time it happens, allow the pain to come in. Because if you don't, that wall is not going to serve you. And it is not going to serve the future kids and the future schools and the future uh, assailants that go out. It's not. So what happens matters. And we need to acknowledge the sad and the scary, even if it's hard, it's going to be hard. There's no doubt about that. It is going to be hard. So have the conversations. You don't need to get into gruesome details necessarily. You don't have to, um, you know, tell the details of uh, someone's account, um, but ask them what they're hearing, ask them what they're feeling, share with them what you're going through as a parent about your concerns, right? Be vulnerable in these conversations. This is a vulnerable time with very vulnerable things happening all these degrees of victimhood that we had or that I talked about earlier. So I said earlier, and, and I always say this, um, if you listen to, um, the beginning of this podcast, or if this is the first time that you've ever heard it, I always say, and I truly, truly, truly believe that the best way to change the world is one living room at a time. I was recently listening to um, Nikki Gumbel, who is the um, head of Alpha. It is a Christian program that I served in for many, many, many years. And um, I just happened to be listening to him last week. I started on Monday before any of this happened. And then um, I was listening as, as the week unfolded. And he echoed what I teach my parents and my families I work with and how to cultivate that all people, all people are looking for three things, love, belonging, and purpose. Almost everything that a person has can fit into those things, love, belonging, and purpose. Never, never have I known a senseless tragedy like this or any, any senseless tragedy to have been committed by a person who actually holds all three of these cards. I can truly say that I have love. I can truly say that I have belonging somewhere. I can truly say that I have purpose. And if I am wrong, let me know. I do want to know. I am a student of biology. I'm a student of psychology. I want to know these things. But to the best of my knowledge, no one that has ever been the, the person that has done these things has those three things truly innately in them in their foundation of who they are. So how can we as a parent, how can we help our children have all of three th- these three things and foster all three of them, right? So that's a big question. Looking at your family, looking at your kids, love, belonging, purpose, love first, helping them f- know that they are belong or that they belong somewhere. And then helping them develop a purpose that is unique to them in their own special, awesome way with their gifts and talents. So love, belonging, and purpose. So we need to really be proactive. I mean, this is where it comes down to. We've uh, proactivity toward mental wellness instead of hoping against and having reactive behaviors toward mental illness, right? It is just like eating your fruits and veggies, which also play a role, by the way, in a lot of our mental health. Um, But it's like eating our fruits and veggies so that we can be physically healthy and also help with our mental wellness. But we have to build mental wellness, not just repair mental illness. Okay. I want to say that again, because it's something that it is that is a norm I would subscribe to. It's not a norm today though. It is not. I hope and I pray it becomes one, but it is not one yet. We need to build mental wellness into our family structure, into our kids, instead of just repairing mental illness. Okay. And mental illness does not need to be a norm. It happens a lot. It is out there a lot. It does not need to be an accepted norm. If you, if you have it be an accepted norm, right, then you're just saying, yep, that's status quo. I am, I, I, I hear this and I'm coming at this from experience. You guys, I've heard kids say to their parents, you know what? 
I'm normal. I'm depressed. Leave me alone. Right? No, that's the last thing. No. Yes. You are a normal kid, but depression does not need to be your normal. Let's help you through that. We want the normal to look like, Hey mom, dad, I am feeling depressed. I need some help. Can you help me? Right. If we can get to that norm, that would be a better norm. I would subscribe to that norm, but not, I am depressed. I am not, my identity is not based in depression, but I am feeling depressed, right? There are two really different things, you guys. So helping our kids build mental wellness, which is exactly what we do here with the people I work with and so many amazing people out there that I know that are building mental wellness instead of just reacting to mental illness and then pray. So I, I am a Christian and I personally think that prayer is one of the most powerful things you can do for someone, but think about uh, even beyond that, think about the side effects of prayer, right? A prayer is a family. You're acknowledging what happened. We're not becoming numb to it. We're not sweeping it under the rug. We are acknowledging what happened. We are talking through our thoughts. We are asking for help. We are accepting the things that we cannot change. And we are asking for strength to do the things that we can, the scary things. And that scary thing could be going and talking to someone in uh, legislation, right? And, And that can make some policy change. Or it is going and talking to a parent that has been shattered by what is happening. Or maybe it is just getting out of bed. Whatever that next step is for you, asking for the strength to do that next uh, right thing for you. So that's a conversation about mental wellness. And this is where I stake my, my life and my work is around helping parents develop that mental wellness within their daughters before they leave home so that they are leaving home with that confidence from the inside out, right? Radiating from them and having the respect for themselves and others, others, right? Others too. And wisdom of themselves and others, how to connect and relate to and take care of others and themselves and all of the other facets of wisdom and respect. But the next conversation you guys is, um, over, uh, gun control and policy. Hold on. So I told you I'm not getting political on here and I am not, but again, like I said, I hope that everyone can see that this is not okay. What is happening is not okay. No matter where you are, the NRA uh, convention is happening right now. And I know so many people that were going decided not to, right? It doesn't mean that they are anti-gun now, right? It just means that they now are saying, you know what? It's not the right time because what happened is not okay. So uh, gun control and policy. This is where people need to stand up and have accountability here. So what can that look like? Well, every person has their own opinion about gun control and I'm not even going to get into mine, but I think and hope we are all on the same page when I say that if you are a person that has guns, protect them, lock them up and be responsible for goodness sakes, be responsible. Now, this case that happened most recently was not a case of somebody taking someone's, but there has been a lot of others that, that were right. They took, they took it from a parent. They took it from a friend. They took it from an uncle, all of these different cases. So just because it wasn't this case doesn't mean it's not a problem. So if you have guns, if you are a person that has guns, then protect them, lock them up, put the ammo somewhere else, be responsible. If you are a person that sells guns, do your due diligence as best as you can, because I don't want the blood of any more victims on to be felt on your hands either. I can't imagine that weight that must be on some of these people. 
If you want to ask your representatives to take action, if you want to go to a rally, if you want to go somewhere and calmly, logically, sensibly talk to somebody about this, then do that. Go make legislation happen if that is what you are called to do. You can help in this arena. If that is what you are called to do, you can help in this arena. I've seen kids recently learn, like within the last week, you guys, before this, but within the last seven days, learning how to shoot guns properly, not because they want to do this or even because it's sport, but because we live in a world where this is unfortunately a possibility. And so they are equipping their children and themselves with the knowledge and know-how of how to use a gun. I, it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because these families didn't want to ever be in this situation, but that's something that they felt that they needed to do. You guys, I, I, you know, I grew up in a hunting family and I get that. And that goes down into one of our other conversations we'll have in a couple minutes, but I get guns. All right. I get them, but not in this way. And we have to take accountability in all of our ways. So we're taking accountability in mental wellness, right? In mental wellness, we need to take accountability in gun control and policy too. Now, our next conversation is bleeds into a little bit with gun control, which is cultural acceptance. So like I said, I grew up in a hunting family. I get it. I have pictures of me in literally a diaper holding a gun. And, um, it was probably the last time I held a gun, but that was, uh, when I was just because in my, my family, they, they hunt and that's okay. Right. If you have a gun to protect your family, I get it. I get it. If your job description has you having one and using one, I get it. Right. You want them. If you want them because they're cool, right. I get it, but there are consequences and precautions that need to be had. And I've talked to a lot of adults that have them because they think that they're super cool and super fun. And it's more of a collector's item that they, and a hobby, I'm more of a hobbyist, right? And I encourage you, if that is you, maybe look at a job, right? A, a line of work that you would have, and you would be able to have that interest come into play, right? That might be something for you. Here's where we really get into some spicy water here is when you think they are American and I'm using quotes here, air quotes, you think guns are an American way of life. Well, they are, and here's the outcome of some of that uh, rhetoric and some of that thinking as well, right? So I beg you the question, what does American mean to you? What does that mean to you? I saw not long ago, within the last year, I saw this picture of this American family, all very, you know, rich, a uh, Caucasian family, uh, well-to-do sitting in this beautiful white, um, big house on their couch, all of these beautiful things around them. And it was, uh, I believe it was a couple of parents. And then it was, um, two daughters and a son that looked like they were all in middle and high school and all of them were holding guns. For me, that was one of the most atrocious, um, sites that I could ever see because, and let me give you my, because before you start, if you're listening to this and rolling your eyes at me, because I had just seen recently right before this, maybe a, a couple of weeks before this, an article about this family over in the middle East that they had guns and they were being trashed because of it. They are violent. They are wicked. Look, all they want to do is bloodshed, all of this stuff. And it was a family in the Middle East that had guns. And now there was this all American family in America that had guns and it was being viewed as picturesque. You guys, this is, this is a cultural acceptance issue that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. What are we, what are we doing? What is our message? 
Why do we have them? What does it mean to be American to you? What does it mean to have that? What feeling do you get if that is you and you have that with you, that you need that kind of power? right? It's not protection at that point. It's power. Uh, and, uh, these automatic rifles, they are not protection. They are power, right? Why do we have to have that kind of power? Like I said earlier, hunting, get it, protecting your family. You have something in the house, get it. Uh, your job has it. I get it. Even I can kind of, kind of understand if you're a collector and a hobbyist, I get it. And you're, you're collecting, you know, these old and nice guns, whatever. Right. But we have an issue when it comes to power. Why do we need the power? Right. Think about it. If uh, one of, one of the things that we talk about all the time in here is power struggles. It's one of the key things we talk about and it is drop the rope, pull up a chair. If if you don't, if you uh, drop your power, right? People can't struggle and one person can't play tug of war. If everyone dropped the power, then we would be able to pull up a chair and actually have conversations, right? These are hard conversations, you guys. These are hard conversations, but ones that have to be had. Now, this is Memorial Day weekend, and I don't know when you're listening to this. It might be recent. It might be in a year or two from now or more, but right now this is 2022 and it's Memorial day weekend coming up. And we are here to celebrate the lives of those that fell to protect this country for a long time. I actually ran a celebration in our town for Memorial day. And I would meet these, um, these veterans that had fallen friends, right. And they were there and they fought for our freedoms, right? Freedom isn't free. I, I totally understand where they're coming from and where that comes from. But do you think for one minute that those people, those men and women that have fallen for the freedom of the United States of America would be okay with these rifles walking into elementary schools? No, right? We need to change the cultural norms here. It's another normal I am not willing to subscribe to. Okay, so we've been through mental wellness. We've been through me mental health. We've been through gun control and policy. We've been through uh, cultural acceptance. And our fourth one that we need to talk about is kind of an umbrella, right? It is school safety, security presence, policy, or I'm sorry, police procedure, and even social media, right? We hear over and over again, the red flags that are going off and people that are seeing some hard behavior, but we're told it's just them, accept them for who they are. Right. And so you're like, well, I guess it's not a red flag. I mean, we, we hear about these kids that are in class and they're sitting in the corner and they're rocking themselves or they have a violent outburst and they're like, it's okay. That's just who they are. We need to accept them for who they are. No, <laughs> no, we do not because that person needs help and they need help before they hurt other people that are going to need help. If that ever is the case, it is not a normal. I am willing to subscribe to you guys. Again, that goes back to the mental wellness that we talked about. We want to be proactive, not reactive, right? We don't want people saying like the excuse I have heard from kids with their parents that say, mom, I am depressed. I am normal. Leave me alone. And they shut the door and the parent just sits there because they're like, well, I guess that's who my kid is. No, you can help. Right. And there's places you can reach out to. There's so many hotlines, there's therapists, there's coaches, there's mentors, and there's an army of people out there trying to help, right? Because we don't want it to get to this point ever again. And I hope if you're listening to this in a year or two or five or 10 from now, that this was the last time that this happened. I fear it's not, but I really hope it is. I really hope it is. So let's talk about this a little bit, because looking back that retrospective look on social media, um, for example, 
in this case, and I, we've seen it happen again and again is, well, they did post this. They did, um, say this on this platform or what have you, we need hands down better regulation there. If someone is posting a, a post of guns and having some obscure, um, uh, um, tagline to it, we need to be able to flag that somehow, because that is a cry for somebody stop me. Somebody stop me, please. I'm going down this road. I am covering it up with, I'm so cool. I'm covering it up with ambiguity. I'm covering it up with, look at me, look at me, look at me, but no one's looking at me. Right. Remember they want to be loved. Everyone wants to be loved, wants to belong and wants purpose. And they're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And no one's looking at me. So I'm going to make them look at me. So social media, I think can have a big advantage here. If we just get the logistics in there and I am not a tech person, I am not an it person, but there has to be some things in there that can be put in place. I mean, if we are doing things like connecting the entire world through these platforms, there is certainly some measures that can be taken in there to flag some things that are happening. Now, some, uh, some people have taken their kids, um, out of school and decided to homeschool in the wake of all of these shootings from years past. And even now, um, the, the conversation is ignited and reignited over and over again. And I don't blame you, right? If this is a possibility or desire for your family in the least bit, I encourage you to try it as always. I, if, if it is in you, if it's a question for you, should we try this, then try it and see what happens. And the worst that could happen is you have some quality time at home and then, uh, you send them back to school. Right. So for, if you're thinking that right now, I just want to say, do I think you should or shouldn't? That's not my place. I do not should on people. So if, but if, if it is something that you're interested in, go ahead try it and see. I did it for seven years and it was one of the most wonderful experiences that I've ever had. And I came into it as a person that had never even thought about homeschooling before, had no experience with it before whatsoever. I was terrible to be quite honest. My first couple of years, I had a lot of, uh, things to figure out and work on both academically and with my kids and with myself, but man, did we make it work? because we dedicated ourselves to making it work and it was incredible. So if that's you and you're listening to this, then try it and see, or reach out. I'd love to be able to help you through that. Um, get involved and know that safety precautions or know the safety precautions at your kid's school. If your kid goes to any school outside of your home, know the safety precautions, right? Know what is happening in there. And yes, you guys, it is such a pain to go in, check in, sign your name, go through scanners, have your bag checked and do whatever needs to be done at the school just to go and like drop off a book or drop off the lunch or the project they forgot at home or what have you. But you know why it's there. Be patient and understand that it is in place for your child. Okay. Uh, understand that no one wants this to happen and people are doing what they can and need your support much more than they need your scrutiny. There are some people, and there was some, to the best of my knowledge, and from what I've seen, there's been some major, you know, mistakes and misunderstandings that have happened, not just this time, but in so many other times. And when you're talking about these, you know, sometimes it's a small town, sometimes it's a big city, sometimes it's rural, sometimes it's, um, uh, um, in uh, like urban areas, right. All these different things. No one, there is no normal when it comes to, uh, who's going to be hit by this, right. We know that. Um, but these people need our support and not our scrutiny as much, right? Especially right in the aftermath when we take off, especially when, you know, this happened in Texas, I'm in North Carolina. If I start yelling and screaming over here, I am not dropping the rope and pulling up a chair. I am pulling on that rope tighter and tighter and tighter, and it's going to hurt somebody. It's going to trip somebody. It's going to make it worse, right? So 
We need to be able to be calm so we can use the logic centers of our brain. We can be accountable in all of these four uh, areas that we're talking about today. And we can actually make progress and go forward. Everybody yelling at each other, everybody pointing fingers at each other is not going to do anything. We need to be calm. We need to be accountable. And we need to move forward and do the next, next right thing in each of these areas, not just one of them or two or three, but each of them. If you are a person listening to this and uh, that works in a sector of the school security and thank you for you uh, to you if you do. And I just want to know that we appreciate your work and we love that you try and help uh, keep our kids safe, right? All of the schools out there, every teacher is rocked. I, I have so many teacher friends um, that work in, you know, any kind of school. Um, uh, not just uh, homeschools, but I'm talking public, private, charter, etc. And every time this happens, it is such a toll on them. The principals, the superintendents, the schools, the teachers' aides, the students, obviously, um, the cooks in the cafeterias, right? All of these, it's so hard and they are rocked every time. So I just want to reach out and give each and every one of you a hug right now, because I know that this is hard. So all four of these conversations, mental health, we have uh, gun control and policy, right? The legislative, uh, we have school safety, security, uh, police procedure, and um, uh, social media, right? And then we have cultural acceptance. All four of these conversations and their results need to have an, that overlap Venn diagram style to keep our children, families, schools, churches, grocery stores, right? This was only 10 days after another one at the grocery store that gunned down all of those people, right? And those amazing people. And uh, our grocery stores, our movie theaters, our restaurants, and our world protected, teaching our kids that finger pointing at whose fault it is instead of being accountable and taking action never solves anything either. So if you are a person that has the guns in your house and you're like, nope, it definitely wasn't this. It was that, right? No, it was everything. Take accountability. I'm not saying you have to get the guns out of your house. If that is who you are and what you do. Again, I am not trying to tell you what you should and shouldn't do here as far as uh, what you have, but you do need to take accountability. I know that we have guns in this house and this is why we keep them locked up. This is why we are so safe with them, or this is why we are going to be, and we are making some changes. And also, how are you feeling about this? And also, Let's go see what's going on at your school and how the safety is there. And also what social media platforms are you on right now? Right. All of these places need accountability. You guys, all of them, it's not just for the people in Uvalde or other people that are scarred and marred and these places that are scarred and marred. That is not where the accountability lies. This is a U.S. problem and can only be solved with U.S. action and U.S. answers to all of these issues. And though the U.S. is far beyond any other country in this respect, other countries do have some of these things as well, sometimes not nearly to the degree that we do, but I don't want to say by any means that we're the only ones. There's been some tragedies all over the world that involve gun violence like this, that involve mental health like this, that involve cultural norms like this, that involve the social media, the um, gun control, the policy, the safety, uh, the security presence, right? It includes it all. So if you're listening to this from another country too, this is not just a U.S. problem. It's just mostly a U.S. problem right now, right? But these changes can be a world problem. I mean, a, a world solution. These solutions can be a world solution. So can we all agree that this is not okay? If we can agree on that, if we can just agree on that, then we can come together and move forward drop the rope, pull up a chair. Everyone takes accountability for all of these areas 
and we find the next right steps for each one of these. No one, no one of these is a solution. It has to be multifaceted and we are all responsible and we are all victims in some way, some tragically more than others. And focusing on what we can do in all four of these areas, starting with in our own living rooms, you guys, with our own kids is where the biggest changes can begin for our future. Okay. You guys, I know this was hard. I know this was a lot. Um, I, I just hope and pray that you are doing well today and that you are hugging your kids today. And I hope and pray for all those that can't both recently and all of those that have lost them and all of these senseless acts in schools, out of schools, on the streets, wherever, right? We can do something about this, you guys, but it takes all of us taking accountability in all of these areas. So keep in touch, you guys. Try to laugh, right? Hug and remember to keep showing up with intention in the 6570, these 6,570 days of our parenthood childhood journey, because they need love, they need belonging, they need purpose, and they need to know that we're here for them. Okay, guys, I'll talk to you soon.